Thank you. Our speaker's lineup is an example of the solidarity that Kim was talking about. My two legs work, but my voice is a little husky. So all together, we, we make our third panelist, who's, who's a full and healthy human being today. <laughs> um, I, I, I have to admit that I panicked for a long time when I received the invitation and the instructions in this invitation to address the idea of the feminine genius um, and then talk about my experience of it because the question has, has plagued me, I think, for, for many years to try to understand what this feminine genius is. You all have a leg up because you heard Helen Alvarez talk earlier today, which I unfortunately missed. Um, but what I'm going to just start with um, is are some thoughts about this. Maybe you just move it forward one for me. Um, that I found in the letter to women that John Paul wrote in 1995. And this is a very simple letter, um, as he goes. Uh, but it's also related to my life and to what I'll talk to you about, because it was written in 1995 in preparation for the International Beijing Women's Conference at the UN. And it was Cairo and Beijing that really caused the founding of the World Youth Alliance and a change in my own life five years later. Um, and I think one of the questions that has plagued me about the feminine genius is that all of us certainly know that there's a male genius too. And I think I, I don't really know how to define this in contradiction to the male genius. And I think everything that I've written here is certainly applicable to what men are called to as well. But since John Paul was great and also a saint, um, and also because he always started from the particular, and, and these quotes really come from his contemplation of the particular woman who was the greatest of all women. Uh, John Paul often started his philosophical thoughts by ruminating, in this instance, he thought, what is women and what is the feminine genius? And so he naturally thought, who was Mary? And he came to the conclusion, well, she was queen of heaven and earth. And what does this have to teach all of us as women? And so I think what we can at least learn from her as some embodiment of what we are called to as the universal um, representation of, of womanhood that she particularized in its perfect sense, is that we're called to serve and we're called to serve with love. The World Youth Alliance, you can just move it forward, was founded in 1999, as I mentioned, uh, during a global conference uh, called Cairo. This was a UN conference on population and development and at this conference, the world leaders gathered together to discuss the questions facing the world's population, the poorest of the poor. And at this conference, they brought in a small group of young people for the first time who were given the floor, who stood up and said, we represent all three billion of the world's youth, and these are our demands as young people. They demanded abortion as a human right, sexual rights for children, and a deletion of parents' rights. And I was sitting there listening to this, and I realized these young people don't represent me, and there are many other young people not represented by these claims. So I went back into the UN the next morning with Dayglo pink flyers, broke all the rules, um, and basically said these young people don't represent all of us. We have a very different vision for what it means to be a human person and to move towards human flourishing. That caused pandemonium. For two hours, the negotiations were stalled, and in that time, the world divided. The Western states huddled around the Clinton delegation, and maybe today is a good day, as good a day as any, to say that Hillary Clinton was a great inspiration for the direction my life would take. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the developing nations came up to me one by one and said, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us. And they said, you need to have a full-time presence at the UN and also come to our countries and work with our young people. So that's what we did. The World Youth Alliance became a global coalition that now has six offices worldwide. We work with young people between the ages of 10 and 30, which is the UN's broadest definition of youth. And we recognized our mission as being the defense of the dignity of the human person in all of the ways that this becomes contested inside the UN. And what we saw as these debates unfolded was that in defending the human person, we were spending a lot of our time fighting violations of the human person. 
And as we opposed population control, abortion laws, all of these difficult violations that were constantly being put upon us, we recognized that there were two areas in which we did not have sufficient responses, and these two areas were the double tips of the iceberg that were driving all of the problems we were seeing internationally, domestically, and locally. And these two programs really came down to curriculum programs being promoted for kindergarten through grade 12 for both sex ed and gender studies, as well as women's reproductive health. And so we began to think, how can we develop a person-centered response, meaning a response rooted in the dignity and reality of each human person, giving us an answer to sex ed and gender curricula and to women's reproductive health? And after contemplating these documents for longer than I should admit, we realized that the answers were there for us in the most difficult parts that were so um, unacceptable to so many people. We realized that sex ed and gender studies are most unacceptable when they're proposed for kindergarten and grade one and two students. But what is the content of these programs? And what we came to see was that this is not science, this is not biology, this gender and sex ed is another word for anthropology. And I always think you should only pick a fight you can win. And given that our anthropology is strong and real and better than the proposed anthropology, this was the solution we started to see. And so we have begun to develop K-12 to curricula that map out a totally different anthropology of the human person so that we can provide this to young people as they move through life. Then we face this question of reproductive health. What is women's reproductive health and how could we respond to it? And what we had to question and ask ourselves was, is contraception and abortion all we can offer for women's health? And is this an answer? And is this of any use to the needs that we have? And if you dig further, it really comes to this question of contraception. Because as many of you know, if a woman has most problems and goes to the doctor, the answer to most of those problems is contraception. And so what we came to understand was that it's our hormones that control our health, and we could look in two different ways. We could look in a way of suppressing that hormonal activity with the pill, or diagnosing and correcting that hormonal activity. And the question was, how could we do that? And so I'm going to try to whiz you through a quick sex ed and reproductive health class in showing you the pro projects that we have tried to develop. Um, and since my legs work, I'm going to walk. So let's see if we can move through. We tested this clicker. And uh, so what we, what we came to understand at the UN, and I just want to highlight this briefly, I mentioned this, but we, we saw that we were debating these terms a lot. And, and this happens domestically and internationally. We talked a lot, and we needed a, a, a verbal and a linguistic solution. But if we want to influence what we call the policy wheel, we have to be able to implement. And this is, of course, because people are not angels. And so if we're talking about serving the human person, we have to be able to serve those physical needs. So this was what led us to understand that we needed not just policy and legal solutions, but we needed implementational solutions that could help us to put that into action. Okay, maybe we've got this going. So when we talk about FEM, this is not easy for you to see, but the important thing here is that we're looking really at hormonal health. And so we're really looking at the correlation between two hormones launched from our brains and two hormones that are developed in our reproductive organs. Here we have the first hormone, FSH, which launches from the brain, and that triggers the development of estrogen in the follicle inside our ovaries. And here's the important thing. We wanna see estrogen rising on a slope. When that slope gets high enough, that follicle ruptures, and LH, this is the second brain hormone, comes. And LH turns that empty follicle from an estrogen-producing follicle to a progesterone-producing follicle. What you can see in this graph is that this is a very intricate dance, 
And I just want to point out two things. All of the hormones come together at their highest levels to cause ovulation. And this is why ovulation is a sign of health. And if ovulation doesn't take place, no progesterone is produced. Because remember, it's the empty follicle that produces progesterone. Why does that matter? Well, here's, a, here's an easy way of seeing how and why ovulation is a sign of health. Because estrogen and progesterone are needed to make all of the functions of our bodies work. And this is why hormones are such a key factor in understanding and treating women's health. When those hormones are imbalanced, naturally or artificially, almost any kind of symptom women normally complain about start to manifest themselves. Pain, depression, irregular cycles, mood changes, um, all of these things are often related to these hormonal irregularities. And the current treatment for most of these irregularities is the pill. And so here I just want to show again, this is what we want to see in a healthy cycle. We, we see this rise of estrogen and then this rise of progesterone. And what's happening in the pill is that they're shutting down all of these symptoms. And this graph is a little bit misleading because in order to shut down all of these hormones, higher levels of hormone that are higher than any of these naturally occurring levels have to be provided. So we're basically seeing a kind of high level hormone blanket that's given to women to suppress their symptoms and to suppress all that natural healthy activity. So the FEM app is one way for women to start to understand and track this. And this is one of our clinics that we've identified to take care of women at Ohio State University. But what we really recognized was that in understanding this hormonal activity, it begged the second question. Do we have better ways of treating women for all these real conditions that they have? Acne, weight gain, weight loss, pain, depression, irregular cycles. Because if not, then the pill is all they have. And what we saw was that when we started six years ago, the answer was that the pill was really all we had. We didn't have better ways to treat all of these things. And so we scoured the globe and we developed a reproductive health research institute, which has been pulling together experts who have now created protocols to enable us to better treat all of these conditions. And I just want to show you very briefly how that works. These are the 12 basic hormones necessary for ovulation to take place. And each of these hormones has, has to happen at the right time, at the right level, in the right way for that process to unfold. And we can see right away why this is such a complex process and how easily something can go wrong. Our protocols help doctors to map through what has become highly specialized literature in knowing now how to examine each of these hormones to not just manage the symptom by suppressing all this activity, but to diagnose and treat the underlying hormonal imbalance. And this is also very hard to see. But to give you an example, here are three cycles that are dry with a little bit of bleeding. And so we're not surprised that all the standard hormones are low. And what we know is that it's not until we get to the primary hormonal disturbance, which is different for each of these three. Here it's high cortisol. Here it's low leptin. Here it's an absence of olfactory bulbs. This is the hormonal investigation that has to take place. Once we know that primary hormonal disturbance, we get a diagnosis. We have three totally different conditions. And as most women know, it's getting the diagnosis that is not easy. Once we have a diagnosis, we can treat effectively. So this is the work of FEM. And I think what, we've, what we came into this, we had a public policy problem. What is women's health other than abortion and contraception? This didn't seem adequate to the needs women have around the world. And what we came out of it with is really moving the science forward. It's not enough to suppress women's bodies. Women deserve diagnosis and treatment for all these common and uncommon symptoms they experience. And then very briefly, I just want to go back to our sex ed discussion. Why do we need a new approach? Many of you may know the answer, but it's good to have data. And I just want to show you a couple of cards that outline the criteria for curriculum topics that are promoted by the World Health Organization and have been adopted by the European region. 
Sometimes we think that what happens at the UN affects Africa. The Europe region and the United States are adopting these same uh, ideas. And I'll leave you to read most of these, but we can see that the WHO is suggesting teaching pleasure and masturbation. These are children ages four to six, not grades, sexual feeling, friendship and love towards people of the same sex. As we move into age six to nine, these are the guidelines, understanding contraception, understanding diseases, and the fact that everyone will get one. Sexual rights of children, these were some of the ideas that we saw when I first was at the UN. And so we realized this is not a curriculum based in the kind of anthropology that we hold to be real and that we think leads to human flourishing. And so we developed the Human Dignity Curriculum, which is currently being implemented and tested around the world, focusing on these questions. Who is the human person? What is human freedom? What is solidarity? And how can we move towards developing the habits for human excellence so that we can achieve human flourishing? And that's an example of grade eight. Um, oh. So I just wanna close by outlining really the strategy that we have tried to embrace. The World Youth Alliance really represents our global coalition of young people working to study and understand this anthropology and implement it in education and policy and culture. And these new programs represent the tools that allow us to do that more effectively, bringing them to our home communities as well as bringing them to global and domestic policy solutions. And I just wanted to show you our scorecard. The nice thing about this scorecard is that it's getting better. When I first showed it, it was pretty dra dra dramatic, and it still is pretty dramatic, and I think it's good to see where we stand. We think, as, as you saw, that the policy cycle wheel is powerful because policy, meaning ideas, are linked to implementation. And I think one of the groups that does this best is Planned Parenthood and International Planned Parenthood Federation. And here we can see in the United States that they have 800 clinics alone. They also operate in 134 countries. And this is what makes them so powerfully uh, effective at a policy level as well. They're also the dominant voice in sexual education, both policy and implementation, and they dominate all of the funding for these capacities at state, national, and international levels. I'm happy to say that over the last five years, FEM has moved from one clinic in Columbus to clinics now in New York City, Lafayette, Oklahoma City. We have new sites currently opening in Malta, France, Italy, and St. Lucia. But that means we still have a long way to go. And with our curriculum, we're currently testing and evaluating this in New York City and the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's being implemented again in Malta, Croatia, the Philippines, and Mexico. And we're looking at adding three new US locations uh, in Minnesota, those will again be Catholic schools, and in Texas and Kansas, those will be public school districts. So we're beginning, we have a plan, we've just begun to be able to bring this forward. Um, so I think there's a lot of good news there, and um, I'm happy to share all of this with you. Thank you very much.